So I, I am, I have the coveted post-lunch coma space. <laughs> so I'll do what I can to be entertaining, um, as inherently entertaining as, as PDFs are. Um, so um, I was looking around the room earlier and I thought, oh my gosh, probably almost everyone in this room knows more about this plugin and XSLT and everything than I do, which is a little intimidating. Um, and if I uh, see already things have gone awry, I can't get my uh, there. Okay, so before I get started, whoops, um, I talked yesterday with uh, Yarno, and he said he will probably not take his full slot for his presentation. So if I have time left after my presentation, I'll take questions. But he proposed that with the extra time that he has, we could do kind of a joint Q&A session. So um, you can either ask me questions after I'm done, if there's any time, or you can wait till you have us both. Up to you. So, so a, a quick background. Uh, I, yesterday, Chris Everline said that she is trained as a historian, and how did she end up here? Well, I will see you and I will raise you. I was trained as a theoretical linguist. So how did I end up here? I have no idea. Um, but I, I, well, I couldn't get a job as a theoretical linguist because there just aren't that many out there. So um, I became a technical writer. And over time, I became an information architect. And eventually, I had to implement DITA for my team. And we could not get any money to do that until we had a proof of concept. And in order to have a proof of concept, we had to show that we could create all of our outputs from Ditto. And one very important output that we had was PDF. And so I sat down one day and started trying to figure out the PDF plugin of the Ditto Open Tool. And it, it took years off of my life, but I think I got there. <laughs> but my point here is that I'm not a developer. I've never had a course in computer science or programming of any kind. So if I can figure this out, pretty much anybody can figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, George. I, I just provided the workaround, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's working, yay. <laughs> okay, so um, as a couple of people have mentioned, the, the PDF plugin is, is a little different from, from the other plugins. And one major difference is that with PDF, you're not, go, you're, you're not going to an online output. You're not going to a screen-based output. You're going to something that could potentially be printed. It's, it's a page-based output, and that's very different. You're turning apples into oranges. And so there, there are a lot of considerations with that. Uh, in fact, there's, a, there's sort of an intermediate transform that takes place that doesn't necessarily take place for any of the other transforms. So the first step that happens, well, and this is a very general process, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on, but generally, one of the first things that happens is the Open Toolkit merges your map into one large DITA XML file. Because unlike online outputs, you don't want a whole bunch of small files, which you may or may not compile into a larger file. You want one large file, one PDF, from many aggregated input files. So the first step is to merge it. And this file is always called whatever your input name is, underscore merge.xml. And then that file is transformed into XSLFO, which is another XML tag set, completely completely different language that is designed for print outputs. And then the resulting file from that is topic.fo. And topic.fo is the file that is sent to the PDF renderer. So it contains all of the formatting information, all the pagination information, everything that your PDF renderer needs to create the PDF. So that's just a very general overview. So where do we start with it? Well, so the first thing to do is to create your own PDF plugin. Do not change the Open Toolkit's default PDF plugin, which is org. 
da da da, or dot da 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 PDF2. If you do, I will hunt you down. <laughs> There's a theme. Um, but really, don't, don't do that. Um, as with any kind of customization you want to do, make your own plugin. Um, the, the structure of the PDF plugin is, is different from other plugins, and I can't give you a lot of details about that because, strangely enough, most people work in the other plugins and don't work in the PDF plugin much. I work in the PDF plugin and don't work in the other plugins very much. So I'm much more familiar with the PDF plugin than any of the others. So I can't draw a lot of comparisons. But um, I will show you the PDF plugin structure. And those of you who are familiar with other plugins can draw your own conclusions from that. So one big difference in the last couple of years is that it, it became an actual plugin. Uh, it used to, and I just downloaded this this morning to, to have a look at for comparison, and I, I'd forgotten how, how, how weird some of the earlier versions of the OT were. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but one of the one of the first things that, that you notice is that in earlier uh, versions of the Open Toolkit, it, it, there was a plugins folder, but the PDF well this was an old PDF plugin, but the, the new PDF plugin wasn't in there. It was actually in uh, in the demo folder um, uh, under FO, and then there was a whole bunch of stuff under there. Um, and as someone mentioned, you, you didn't really, when you wanted to customize it, you used a customization folder. You didn't actually create a plugin. And when I started writing my book, this was the way it was done. And it took me so long to write that book that I think I went through like four versions of, of the Open Tool for writing that book. And I was so happy when I downloaded the latest version and I saw that it had really become an honest, to God plug-in. I was thrilled. Um, so if, if you've still got this sort of legacy thing going on, do not be discouraged. It's not that difficult to sort of convert it to a plug-in. You, you won't really have to start from scratch, per se. So don't let that necessarily be a barrier to, to moving to a newer version of the OT. But that's enough of the past. <clears throat> In the present here, the OT plugin, or did a PDF2, is actually in the plugins folder along with everything else. So it's, it's very modular now. Everything is much more self-contained. And inside of there, there's some, some folders you may have recognized from the old way that I just showed you. Um, a lot of stuff that is not really pertinent to your customization. The uh, Open Toolkit comes installed here inside of the plugin with an installation of FOP, which is Apache's free PDF renderer. Um, and, you know, it's free, and you get what you pay for. Um, it works for testing. I wouldn't try to use it for real production quality PDFs. It's getting better, but it's, it's got some issues. Um, but essentially, inside of, of there's, you know, well, you know what? Let me, not, let me not show you this. Let me show you the plugin, because that's really where you're going to go with this. So creating a plugin, pretty much very standard. They're all going to look basically like this. And the, creating this PDF plugin is, is a very sort of cookie cutter thing to do. If you've created one, you, you, you can create a thousand of them. It's very, very, very standard. Um, but you've got um, you've got your build file, you've got your plugin file, and among other things, your plugin file um, identifies the trans type for this plugin. So, like any any plugin, uh, it, it's going to need a unique trans type. So you can identify this plugin as as the output that you want to produce. Um, and 
this plugin, any, any PDF plugin that you create, ultimately is dependent upon the default plugin. Because you're probably not going to include all of that processing in your plugin. You're not going to customize absolutely everything from start to finish. You're only going to customize some things. And then you want to invoke the default processing for the things that you didn't customize. Uh, a very simple uh, template. Pretty much just calling uh, the DITA to PDF build file. Um, but the real, the real interesting part of the plugin is inside of the CFG, the config folder. And that's where you're actually going to do your work. So there's a catalog file, which like any catalog file, pretty much points to all of the other pieces of the plugin. And these two folders are somewhat duplicates of what is found in the default plugin. In the common folder, uh, if there's any artwork, any logos, anything like that that are specific to this plugin, of course you can store them in other places, but I, I like to store them with the plugin so everything is very portable and self-contained. Um, any uh, customized index processing file, any custom properties files. In this VARES folder, the, um, the, the PDF plugin comes with, I don't know, eight or ten uh, files, each one language specific, with localization variables. So there's a lot of boilerplate text that you want to insert in your output. Things like labels for figures and tables and notes and so forth that you don't want those things in your content because that would increase your translation costs. So instead, you just, the, the open toolkit uh, uses variables and then calls that variable with whatever value you've given that variable for that particular language. So we'll look at this file a little bit later as I go through some customization. Um, and then in the uh, FO folder, there's the font mappings file, which as you might suspect, specifies the fonts that you want to use in your PDF. And then the layout masters file, which specifies, uh, well, it's one of the many files that specify your, your, your page dimensions, your page properties for the PDF. The, a, the attributes subfolder um, contains, uh, well, these are style sheets, but I call them attribute set files just to distinguish them from the style sheets that are here. And these just specify attribute sets, which, strangely enough, are sets of attributes that are used to format your different elements. So, for example, for P, you might specify font size, font weight, font color, um, line height, any other properties. And if you've worked in CSS, you'll recognize that most of the attributes in these files are identical or very similar to CSS attributes. Which sort of leads a little bit into what Radu is going to talk about later, using CSS in the first place to, uh, <laughs> to generate a PDF without kind of going, going around the world to do it. Um, I'm going to skip this folder, there's nothing in there. And then in here are uh, some other style sheets that contain templates that actually process the different elements. Um, so you can sort of think, if, if you want to be simplistic about it, that the attribute set files determine what the elements look like in the PDF. And the style sheets in here determine how the elements behave, how they're processed in the PDF. Now, you may have noticed that I, I choose to copy files from the default plugin to my own plugins. So, for example, um, there is a toc.xsl file here in the default, and I've just copied it, the whole thing, into my plugin, and then I make changes to it. I just like to do it that way. I, I don't have any better justification. I just like to do it that way. Um, typically, for, for a real commercial grade PDF customization, you are going to change hundreds 
and hundreds of attribute sets and templates. And so for me to be copying them individually into either the, the um, custom file in the plugin or into other files that I create in the plugin, it's real easy for me to lose track of what's where. So I just copy the whole file. Does it make upgrading a little more difficult? Yes, it does. But, you know, we pays our money and we takes our chances. Um, so. so then inside of both of these folders, I, I have a custom file. And this custom file just imports all the other files that I add to this folder, all of the other attribute set files and style sheets that I add here. And my catalog file, again, is just pointing. It's just pointing to all of those. It's pointing to my custom XSL in the attribute subfolder, the custom XSL in the XSL folder, my font mappings, so forth. All right, so I'm going to just start with this, this, this first plugin that I created here. Um, it's just, I just copied the files I needed as is into the plugin. I've made no changes to them. So I'm gonna generate some quick output here and it is going to be basically identical to what you would get if you just used the OT's default uh, plugin. I, I, have, I have this output into a log file because I prefer it that way. Otherwise, you could see everything scroll by that's happening here on this window. But I like to have a log file for troubleshooting instead of it being sort of transient. So. You can send to the log file and on this one. Uh, I got Michael to stand up and turn around earlier. Is he willing to do it again? <laughs> well, it's a line there between here and there. Um, so this is a very generic, out of the box PDF. It's not horrible. It's not great. Um, Probably your company's look and feel is a lot different. And if you give this to the people with the money, they'll say, well, but that's not what our stuff looks like. Uh, but it is at least functional, and all of the pieces are there. And we just need to figure out how to make this look better. All right. Name this one. Okay. No explanation. I just heard like a bird or a, a laser or something. That's that's entertaining. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the first thing uh, that you can do that can have a big impact on the way the PDF looks is to choose the correct fonts that you actually use. Um, normally, well, if you're using one of the commercial PDF renders, if you're using um, XCP or you're using Antenna House, you have to configure your fonts in two places. You have to tell your plugin which fonts I'm using. And then you have to go and configure those fonts in the configuration file for the renderer as well. This is the one thing that FOP does better than them. As long as your fonts are installed in the default location for your operating system, FOP can find them. 
So you do not have to configure FOP's fonts. And I'm using FOP today just because by default it's the one that comes with the toolkit, so I'm just sort of staying with the, the base installation. So the two fonts that we're going to use are Trebuchet and uh, Book Antiqua. And as I've mentioned, Who's that bird again? <laughs> yeah. Who's the Ditta bird? It's, a, it's the Ditta bird. Um, the two, the, so the, the uh, fonts that I'm using, It's probably not visible to the back row either. I can make it a little bigger. <laughs> Better. Uh, a little better in the back. Okay. Um, there are three font families by default: serif, sans serif, monospace. Uh, you can add additional families if you want, alternatives. Um, but I'm just going to, um, oops, that's the wrong one. I did, I, I went ahead and pre-edited pre everything last night so I would leave nothing to chance and I didn't know how my time would run today. So in the second version of the plugin, I've added Trebuchet as the preferred font for Sans. I've added Book Antiqua as the preferred font for Serif. And I just left Courier New as the preferred font for um, Monospace. So like I said, I'm using FOP, so that's all I have to do. And of course, ensure that these fonts are actually installed on my system. Okay, and then right away there's a couple more easy changes you can make that will have a big impact on the way the PDF looks. And these these particular changes are found in the basic settings file of the, of the plugin. So you need to copy basic settings from the default plugin to your plugin. And, oh, sorry, wrong one. Um, so I have set this to be the uh, A4 page size, which is common European uh, page size, which is 210 millimeters by 280 millimeters, I think. I looked it up, that's what they said. 279. Oh, 297, sorry. 297. Done. Um, a page margin of uh, 25 millimeters, about an inch. I'm, I'm an American, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> um, and then there's, a, if, if your page has different margins on different, different sides, you can configure that as well. So they, they give you four options here out of the box. Inside, outside, top, bottom. So I want my top and bottom and inside margins to use the default page margin that I just created, 25 millimeters. But I want my outside margin to be narrower. I want it to be about half of my inside margin, so 12 millimeters. I wanted to say half an inch, but I stopped myself. <laughs> um, mirror page margins, by default, this is set to false, which means you're going to get single-sided pages. If you want double-sided pages, just change this to true. And then a default font size, which is going to pretty much be used everywhere unless you specify something different. Um, 
It's 10 point, I think, by default, but I'm not getting any younger, so I'm setting it to 11 point. And uh, default line height, I like to have my lines a little bit open, so I'm going to set that to 14 point. Now, this, this file, there, there's... Since, since we have Open Toolkit people here, there's just a funny little thing that I, I, I want to point out about this, uh, this file. Um, uh, I know, I'm lost, I'm lost in my... Uh, I'm lost in my folders here. Um, I, I've never, I've never figured this out. So, the, in the, in the, in the out of the box basic settings file, the measurements are set to U.S. letter size, but they're in millimeters, <laughs> which nobody in the U.S. probably <coughs> would use. So I'm thinking maybe if you're going to default it to the U.S. letter size, maybe you should also default it to the U.S. Yeah. measurement system. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Just, that's just me. <laughs> that's a very American way of looking at it. <laughs> well, you don't have to default it to the U.S. letter size. You could default it to A4, and then millimeters would be perfectly consistent. But if you're going to default it to an American page size, then at least, you know, be, be consistent. It should, it should be but the, anyway. It should, be, it should be the universal page size, right? Which yeah. is 8 inches by 11 inches. Right? Then it Any, fits on anything, both Any, anything as long as it's consistent. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> Very minor point. Just, just, just an aside. You know, you look at these files long enough and you start getting a little bit delirious. <laughs> um, okay. So I set those things, and now it's time to generate the second version of our PDF. <coughs> and we get to stare at the black screen some more. I guess actually the, the next time I go through, I'll, I'll take that, that log parameter out and you can actually see the action happening right in front of you. We need something to occupy us. <laughs> I should have brought some music or something. Can we, can we get the bird back? Beautiful dance. No. No. <laughs> Is, is there a reason why why keep, um, why the idiom technologist stuff is maintained? I mean, they haven't had anything to do with it for ages, have they? Do they even still exist? Is no. Can you repeat? They were bought by SDL. SDL. Right. So why is it still there? Which one? What do you mean? We just we had a question about is there any reason why the uh, the idiom technology, wording, phrasing is still maintained when they haven't had anything to do with this plugin for years. And the answer was sort of a universal, I don't know. Okay. Okay. They, they have the copyright, so it still has to be attributed to them, even though they don't exist anymore. If you don't exist, what do you want? The copyright is eternal. Well, SDL bought idiom, so presumably SDL would own okay. the copyright. That's okay. true. That's true. Okay. All right. So here is our. This is annoying. It's never really wanted to be. So it's already looking just a little bit better, if I could just get it to scroll. So we've got a slightly nicer font. Um, a little bit of an improvement. Um, you can see the, the page margins are different. This is an inside margin. This is an outside margin. So that did, that did change. Uh, 
Um, now it's the other way around, so we do have our, our double-sided pages now. Um, the text is a little more open and so forth. So it's just a, just a little tiny bit more polished than the out-of-the-box version. Yes? Let's make this the default then. Hey, I would be, I'd be happy to do some work on cleaning up the, you know, the default style sheets. Call me. Uh, question in the back? So isn't the problem as far as I'm playing to the party? So you can run it and run it nicely because you have the fonts installed in your system. Right. So if you don't have the fonts installed in your system, you have a problem. So what I'm doing, I have basically, I ship either to two clients uh, basically running it on the client system. So if they don't have the fonts installed, so we actually we changed the plugin actually to incorporate all the fonts as well. Because the, the standard tweaks, how DTOT says you have to do it, doesn't work if you basically have to ask somebody else. They need to install the fonts on their systems, which requires a lot of hassle. You need to go, you need to go to sysadmins to get the fonts installed so they can see it properly. Why doesn't DTOT offer a nicer way to just incorporate the fonts inside DTOT so you can just ship the fonts with the PDF as one big package? Uh, the, the question to paraphrase is that the way uh, things are designed now, you have to have the fonts installed on your system uh, to be able to, to generate the PDF with the look and feel that you intended. And so why is there not a better way to actually be able to incorporate the fonts into your plugin so that you can ship everything together? I don't know, would anybody else like to take that question? Yeah. I can tell later. I can tell. Okay. It actually can be done. And we are doing it. So you just specify it in the XSL input, you push it into FO, and the right renderer takes it and incorporates it in a PDF as Adobe would do it. So it's possible, and we do it for, we've been doing it for eight years. Are you talking about it embeds the font, or are you? Yeah, it, it embeds it as, as it should be. In I, know, I think he actually is saying you could ship the actual font files yeah. with your what plugin. But it's not installed on the machine. Yeah, yeah but, it's, it's, but some customers really want to have a PDF experience as they used to, so just embed it. There's no point messing around. Well, but, but this is actually for the generation process, not for the viewing process. I, I think if I, if I understood the question correctly. The big problem with fonts is copyright. Sure. So, uh, the, the big problem with, with fonts is copyright. So you, the, the last thing you want to do is start sending around copyright font. The way around that would be to find open source fonts, yeah. and there are a few of those, and one of those is Deja Vu, um, and it happens to look quite good and I've used it, and so that could be an option. Uh, someone in the back has a comment. <laughs> George is getting his workout today. So, 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 as a part of the plugin, of course you can. It's a question of configuring uh, your XSLFO renderer. If you configure your XSLFO renderer, it can pick up the funds from, where, for, from wherever you want. Okay, so clearly I thoroughly underestimated uh, how much time I would have. So I've got to rush through the last uh, bit. I'll just, I won't generate the PDF every time. I'll just run through the changes and then I'll kind of show you the finished version. And uh, you know, these, these things always take longer than you, than you think they will. So some other big impact changes you can make are in, uh, in, in the Commons Attribute uh, files. So topic titles are an eye-popping thing. They're something that people who look at your PDF will notice right away. So if you can get those formatted the way they're supposed to be formatted, that makes a, a big change in the whole look and feel of the PDF. So those are uh, formatted in commons attribute.xsl. Um, there are, I think, six. Uh, there's topic.title, topic.topic.title, topic.topic.topic.title, and so forth for each hierarchical level of your title. So you can format those. And formatting your text, 
you can, you know, if, you, if you can just figure out uh, the attributes you need for things like uh, li and p uh, and note and, and just the, the major elements that you use, uh, you, can, you can get a lot of quick visual impact that way too. Um, to format list text and bullets and numbers, uh, you use lists, attribute, and you also use that en.xml file. And I do just want to show you that really quickly because it, um, it's important. So these are the localization variables. So you would have one of these files for every language that you were uh, translating or localizing in. And the actual, the variables that are in the file, of course, the names are the same. It's the content that is different. Um, so, uh, for example, you can specify the character that you want to use for your unordered list bullet. You can specify the, the heading at the top of the table of contents and the heading at the top of your index file. Uh, you can specify in your table of contents if you want to have like chapter one, colon, whatever. You can specify that word. Is it chapter? Is it capitulo? Is it chapitre? Is it something else entirely? Um, uh, for um, the labels for your different note types, you can specify those here. By default, the, 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 the PDF has this like pointing hand icon next to notes, which probably no one wants. Um, <laughs> And you can take that out by uh, just clearing the appropriate uh, path from these different variables. That's a, a quick and easy way to get rid of, of that uh, icon. Uh, so all of the boilerplate text that, that is going to be rendered automatically by the, the, the process is in here. And so this is where you would make those changes. So this is a one-stop shop file to change a lot of stuff very quickly. Um, I just mentioned most of this stuff. The, uh, the tables stuff for changing uh, header rows, for changing text inside of tables and all that, that's going to be in tables attribute. So most of these files are fairly intuitively named based on there's tables, there's lists, there's, you know, but if anything, if you can't figure out where anything is, if nothing seems to fit, look in commons.xsl or commons attribute.xsl. That that's sort of the kitchen sink. Everything that's not found anywhere else is found there, basically. Um, let me skip the PDF generation. Uh, you, I mentioned you can change the other labels. There's a couple of uh, properties that you can use in your, your build file, your target, that can um, add labels to each section of your tasks. So it can add a label to your prereq, a label to your context, a label to your steps, to your example, to your result. So if you want those labels, you can change that parameter in your in your build file to include it. And of course, in that in that variables file I just, I just showed you is where you determine exactly how that label reads. Um, the uh, default PDF has a little sort of mini TOC or a, a li little mini list of links in, in each chapter and on the first page of the chapter. If you don't want that, uh, you can add this parameter or property to your build file and you can eliminate that. <laughs> um, some other fairly low-hanging fruit, um, if you just want to move information from the header to the footer, for example, uh, in the default PDF, the page number is output in the header. If you want that in the footer instead, you can move that in uh, static content and again in the variables file. Uh, you can add or remove entry levels in your TOC. By default, the TOC contains three levels of, of headings. If you want more or fewer, you can just change that number. Um, applying different formatting to TOC levels. Um, it's really fun to format the TOC because there's so many little layers. Layers wrapped in layers, wrapped in layers, wrapped in layers. Um, and I actually deconstructed that and, and wrote about it, explained it. Uh, in my book, uh, exactly which attribute set is affecting which part of the TOC? Because there's the label, and then there's the there's the, the, the name of the topic, and then there's the the uh, page number, and on and on and on. So, 
I explained it, I, I explained it once, and I'm, it wore me out. I can't explain it again. Um, <laughs> get the book. If, get the book, exactly. Um, if you want to add a logo to the cover page, that's pretty easy to do. You do that in front matter XSL and front matter attribute dot uh, XSL. Um, a little bit harder um, is to do something like put the chapter label and number and title on the same line. There, by default, they're rendered on three different lines, which again is probably not anything that anybody wants. Um, most people would at least want the chapter. Uh, label and number on one line and then maybe the title below that or maybe all on one line So that's a little tricky. You have to do a little bit of black magic But you can make that happen um, Adding information from say your book meta or your topic meta and your map to the cover page That's fairly straightforward um, Though the trickiest part of that can be getting exactly the right X path to get that piece of information out of the book meta or topic meta it's um, not in itself hard. You just have to do it in several different places. So it's not entirely intuitive that you have to use like two or three different files to accomplish this. Um, and finally, the two things that I consider to be stupidly hard. And, and when I say they're stupidly hard, I mean they're not impossible. They're just so much harder than they should be. And do I have a better way? No, because I'm not a, I'm not a developer. But they're just they're just really hard to do. Setting up master pages it involves like four different files, and and the chapter on that in my book I kept rewriting because my publisher was like I don't understand. I still don't understand. I still don't understand. And I was about to give up because I I just couldn't think of another way to explain it. But finally he said, Okay, I think I got it now. And formatting the index, oh my god, the index, index XSL does not look like any other style sheet in this plugin. It is impenetrable to me. I just stab at it and just see what happens. I, I, I really, you know, I, I um, so it's tricky. All right, so as a parting gesture, um, I'm going to generate the last iteration of the PDF after I've made all these changes that I had sort of planned to show you. We need a workspace uh, workshop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is this is like an all day or or two or three day thing. I'm supposed to look at you. <laughs> so this is what it was being sent to that log file. It was not appearing on the screen. So aren't you glad you're getting to see that? Don't you all feel so much better? I feel much better. Now, yeah. But the thing is, if you do this enough, you're sort of watching it and you can see right away, oh, my bill just failed. And then you have to wait for it to finish failing. Is there, did you, is there an easy way to set up rules for pagination um, so that you don't break in the middle of a short list, you know, or something like that? Um, not pagination per se. I mean, there are keep with next, keep with previous, keep together, things like that. Attributes that you can add to attribute sets to specify I don't want to break in the middle of this element. That's pretty much how you have to do it at the, at the element level. And... Uh -oh. I'm going to have to do that again because I oh. forgot. <laughs> it would be nice if there was a big message here. Close the other PDF, you idiot. <laughs> I can't regenerate it on top of itself. You can on a map. Refresh. Yeah. Acrobat doesn't. Doesn't, uh, it doesn't log it, it, it down. You just have to close the window open. Blame it on Windows. Yep. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. We always blame it on Wednesday. <laughs> it's an easy target. <laughs> In this case, it's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we got it now. So it looks quite a bit better. So I made some changes. I added the company name to the cover page. Um, I added a logo on the cover page. Um, I did some different formatting for the different levels of the, uh, of the TOC. I changed the heading of the TOC. Um, I put uh, the page number in the footer instead of the header. Uh, I added some, some boilerplate text. I brought in the company name again from my book map into the, into the footer. Um, <coughs> Uh, I, put, I put these three things on one line instead of on three separate lines, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So, you know, just with a few changes, I did quite a bit of, quite a bit of look and feel uh, manipulation on this PDF. So, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Uh, you can get a lot of changes really fast. And if you're, if you're not a developer and you just need basic changes for a POC, you can probably, you know, put that together fairly quickly. So, uh, I'm totally out of time, over time, so I, I have gone 10 minutes into, into his, uh, <laughs> into his uh, slot, so I will, I will vacate the premises and we'll deal with any other questions when we do our, our joint Q&A after, after his presentation. So, okay. thank you. Thank you.